Spatial Limits Consortia Burn Center for Precision Medicine um, seminar series on spatial omics. Um, thank you for joining. Um, today we have um, a really exciting speaker. Um, we have Jerry Lynn from um, Boston. Um, and so just a couple of housekeeping um, bits and pieces, if you can put any questions you have in the chat. Um, and we will be recording this uh, meeting. And um, yeah, uh, so um, Jerry, welcome. Um, Jerry earned his uh, PhD in 2012 in Stanford University. Um, and he had a very successful um, uh, traineeship during this time um, and published many um, impactful papers. Um, he then joined the uh, Laboratory of Systems Pharmacology at Harvard Medical School in 2013. Um, and he now serves as the technical director of the tissue imaging platform. Um, and he's continuing his postdoctoral research work. Um, and this involves integrating compute, uh, contemporary computational and experimental approaches to comprehend drug gene interactions in cancer. Um, and he specifically focuses on developing novel imaging methods for high content live imaging in research settings. And um, of particular interest to many of us, uh, multiplex imaging methods for clinical samples. Um, so he's going to present today um, his talk on 3D multiplex and multimodal imaging of human tumors. Um, yeah, and Jerry, I'll let you start. Thank you so much. Yeah, can everyone hear me okay? Thank you. Yeah. Thanks, Hannah, for the nice introduction, as well as this great opportunity to meet everyone and share our work here. So let me try to share my screen so we can start. Okay. Can everyone see my slide? Okay, good. Sorry. Sorry for the extra long title, but I promise you will be much more interesting than title, I hope. Yes. So today, uh, maybe just a few online to uh, set up the, the talk or expectation here, and as well as yeah, I apologize. I just realized I did not ask how long the talk should be. So we might need to go a little faster since I prepare a little more material, but hopefully we can cover most things I, I would like to share with you. So, so for, uh, there are four online probably what I want to share with you today. First, of course, overview of the multiplex image, uh, approach we are using right now or maybe also a little bit overview of the what's out there as a different approach. And second is I want to share you one of the story using our specific method to probe pollen cancer in 3D. And later on, I want to also introduce you a new uh, method we are still developer to uh, increase our capacity to do this kind of multiplex image. Then finally, I want to uh, share with you some of our future direction and future outlooks. So without further ado, I would just try to do a brief introduce. And also why we need to, yeah, I think there's a general thing is why we need to have multiplex image, why we need to do in multiple thing, uh, looking at multiple thing in one sample. And uh, the, without further explanation, it's probably due to an our research focus is mainly on oncology, a tumor. And uh, as you all know, this heterogeneity, either intratumor or intratumor heterogeneity, is always a challenge to try to either try to understand the tumor as well as come up with a, a treatment solution for a tumor. And here, just a few uh, figures we come in, uh, I found from the review to illustrate what's the challenge here and uh, why we will be benefit if we can look at multiple things at once, because the, the final goal is we want to understand this heterogeneity and the better have idea to develop a, some sort of treatment approach. And also for further uh, emphasize this point is the, the developer of immunocon college. I think recently the success of immunocon college demonstrate that uh, if you want to treat tumor, target tumor itself is probably not enough. You want to target the whole microenvironment. And microenvironment here is including the immune cell, stroma cell, 
and also how this cell contact with the tumor cell. And one of the most, I think, most promising drug we have right now is uh, anti PD one or PD one drug. And this is uh, definitely a mediate the junction between the tumor cell and the immune cell, and how the tumor cell can evade from the host uh, attack. So in that way, uh, try to understand this engagement. It's certainly important to understand how this drug will work, right? So here I just using a picture to show why the multiplex or basic image method would be particularly useful. Although here is not a tumor, but we use the human tonsil as an example. As you can see here, we only uh, be able to show a few marker like here, uh, like six marker here, but you can see we already cover a lot of things we can probe here. For example, we have a T, uh, T cytotoxic T cell marker, CDA, we have a macrophage marker CD68 in green and also T red in white. And the PD1, PD1, of course, you can see here, although here is has more representation and the uh, PD1 thinks the T cell is out there. And also PD1, in this case, they are distributed differently. So, so in a way, I think in the image method, especially this as high price image method, can give you three layer of information. Not only you can get a composition of this cell, as well as the distribution. And in in further, uh, you can see how this uh, interaction between the cell. So that's why I think in, um, maybe the, the fast development in the past like 10 years, there are a lot of interest from the industry. They are developed various methods, either on the multiplex image itself or the analysis pipeline, as well as some sort of reagent. And this is, uh, I think people try to join this or try to come in this market is not because it's a business, uh, it's a big business, but also what's the potential in therapeutic or in understand tumor biology. So we are particularly focused on one aspect of this kind of special approach that uh, I will summary as a, we call the antibody-based special proteomic. And uh, we are using this method called Slicer, but there are multiple methods out there. Like I say, there are a lot of uh, the commercially available methods. But the, the, the things I try to highlight here is, although there are various platforms from commercial, but there are also a few that's from the academy. So pretty much like free to use method. And in the end, I will try to summarize what's the pros and cons of all this method. But first I want to just do a very brief introduction of our own method. It calls cyclic immune fluorescence. And the principle of cyclic immune fluorescence is really simple. I think that's also one thing I like <laughs> my mess, my own method very much is it's just like the traditional immunofluorescence. You just send a sample using the, the for, for, fluorescent conjugate antibody, then the image then. Then the only trick we're using here is we have a chemical solution that can bridge in out the fluorophore. But I want to emphasize here, we only attack the fluorophore, but not the antibody itself. So then we can repeat this process multiple times. And after that, we can use a computational workflow to assemble all the image together into a single hyperx image. And this has been published, uh, I think, ten, almost 10 years ago. And we still try to develop uh, either in the computational pipeline as well as the experimental method itself. And particularly, I think it's interesting, and we try to emphasize in our uh, manuscript uh, or in our paper earlier is for some of the clinical sample, especially the FFP sample, the autofluorescence is become a challenge to do immunofluorescence or cyclic immunofluorescence in this kind of sample. And we're using a, a particular way to deal with that. First is whatever the chemistry we are using, we're using hydrogen peroxide based station approach. They actually can reduce quite a lot this kind of autofluorescence background, mm -hmm. as well as we taking this kind of pre-image step to try to capture the autofluorescence on the same sample. So now we have the information, either we reduce this to certain degree, as well as we have the information where is the high autofluorescence region. So we can prevent the interference of the autofluorescence on our signal. 
Okay. And a, a lot of effort, since we published Master, a lot of effort in the lab is try to come up with a list of the antibody that we can use to probe various aspects of the tumor. Here, I just use a figure adapt from the, the tumor, home of tumor. You can see, uh, although for, for many years, people try to study a particular aspect of this uh, hallmark. But we are thinking now is the time we can have an overview to look at this all at once using this multiplex method. So then uh, the, the, the approach we are taking things, a lot of validation we are done, we are, sorry, I, I need to rephrase this. We actually not generate this antibody in our lab. Most antibody we get is the commercially available fluorescence antibody just out there on the market. And uh, that's a good thing because then if people want to repeat out of war, they can just get this antibody there and then sell. But we are doing a lot of things in the lab, try to uh, validate this antibody, make sure this antibody is as it promised from this vendor. So uh, since we are only using the human sample, there are some things we cannot do since we cannot do a knockout or, or an overexpression test, but that's, I would say that's been done by the vendor. So we can take the advantage of the validation done by vendor, but we have further validate here using a various criteria. For example, for some antibody, we know a specific tissue distribution. So we can use that to validate this kind of antibody like e adherent or vimentin there represent the epithelial mesenchymal cell. So we can try to see what kind of distribution in the various tissue. As well as we can look into it further since we are just the traditional immunofluorescence. So we can push our resolution even higher to see this kind of subcellular resolution or subcellular localization of this tumor. Uh, here we're using a lamine as an example. You should see a mucus ring of lamine. So that's kind of feel comfortable this antibody is as it promised. But finally, I think it's most important we use quite a lot in our multiplex uh, validation is we try to use antibody to validate another antibody. And we can do it very extensively. Since we know from a prior knowledge, we know some antibodies should be co-expressed in a certain cell type. Here we use the example, the T-cell marker. CD3 will be a more general T-cell marker and the CDA will be particular uh, cytoplasmic T-cell, but we should see an overlap between the CDA and CD3. So that gives us confidence of one antibody versus the another. So with this kind of validation, we actually share our information from our website, www.sysif.org. So we have a list of antibody validate and I think a good thing we, here is we either list as a working or not working, but not just show the things it's only working. So it, it, if you want, you can go into the list and try to figure out if the, the person of interest is there and you can start using this antibody. So the mass have been developed for, for over 10 years and uh, there, are, there are some, uh, some uh, interesting going on because we start this mass from the culture or cell culture or in vitro system. But now we shift this totally to maybe completely to the tissue image or from the clinical sample for various reasons. Uh, and I thinking we have some uh, success in the size of measure, either using in the clinical or basic research. Since we, like I said earlier, this is being developed in vitro system. It can go all the way from in vitro system to mouse to the human sample. So you can thinking about uh, either you want to use that in the basic research as well as, so as more translational research, you can also use the similar approach. So I think that's the powerful, I think, by using cycling more for essence. And we, although it, this cannot be done by only one lab, we have a lot of collaboration across different institutes and also across different tumor or disease type. And very glad that we are, yeah, here in Boston, we have a unique opportunity to collaborate with all the uh, people here. That's uh, very nice. Although we also co collaborate international or with some other uh, folk uh, around the world. So, so the use of cyclic immunofluorescence, I hope uh, we can show you here. 
it's our lab, uh, although uh, or the LSP, the lab of system pharmacology, probably uh, it's not the only people using uh, cyclic morphers. There are a few other labs out there start to adapt, you know, cyclic morphers to doing their research. That's the things we feel very uh, happy, uh, myself feel very happy about. Since we are an open source method, it's not tied to any proprietary component, and we hope we can share this method with app as many people as possible. Okay, so we start, I want to just briefly introduce a, a quick story that how we use this immunofluorescence uh, cyclic immunofluorescence to probe the colon cancer in 3D. So uh, the colon cancer in a way that still, although there are a lot of progress in how to early detect and uh, treat colon cancer in US, but still is a problem here that's uh, for, for various reasons. And I think particularly that draw people's attention is not only the, the, the success of immunotherapy and colon cancer, that's of course will be very interesting to see if we can push this further. But also uh, I think nowadays they found that early onset colon cancer become a problem because usually they thinking this is a disease of age. But now they start to figure out the people under 50 or even uh, younger, they start to get colon cancer for various reasons. So still a lot of research you need to put in. And also we start to develop various, try to understand more than we can develop a various uh, therapeutic approach for colon cancer. And we are using a particular angle because we are thinking, uh, although uh, there are various ways to approach uh, this by using special uh, only approach, but we are thinking because usually people only look at a very small, either only one slice of your whole tumor, or the further down, I think for the special omic work, the tissue microarray has been used quite a lot. The reason is just the way the uh, special omic approach usually is that limited by its throughput. So if you want to increase your number of sample, number of patients, you need to use this kind of subsample approach, tissue microarray. I will in introduce later more carefully. So, but we kind of taking a different approach. Like for one particular tumor, we actually get multiple serial section and do either do a more traditional histology stand as well as cycling neurofluorescence that's with various panel. So then we want to see if any of feature we recapitulate in 2D, would that be interest have a interesting high dimensional feature that we overlooked previously. And uh, that's kind of the overarching uh, the land, uh, landscape of our 3D CRC uh, atlas, as well as we have a tissue microarray, of course, like have 93 patients. But in this tissue microarray, we're also taking a subset of the sample that we probe the whole, uh, the, 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 the entire section. That can get, give you an idea that if you do this kind of subsampling, what kind of thing you will see in different from the whole section. So the sampling issue is always there since even for the, 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 the clinical the, the resection sample, it's also from a big tumor. But in a way that also a clinical, uh, uh, some other plan, uh, clinical practice will take cold biopsy from the samples. So that's a very small piece of tissue as coming from your, your big tumor. But I think in the research setting, we also use this tissue microarray format. Pretty much just from your whole block or a whole big sample, we use a needle to take a subsample and try to array on a slide. So in a case, it's one slide you can probe to 100, 200 patients if impossible. So, but I think this become a, I think we always thinking this become maybe become a challenge or problem or issue in here. And uh, the way we call this special sampling issue, uh, it's not been discussed too much in the research or in our research, but it's being discussed quite a lot in the other uh, domain or other research like uh, geology, ecology, uh, ecology, because uh, when they do their survey, they also have the same problem that they only 
sampling a, a region and you try to figure out what's the overall distribution of the certain species or certain plant or certain feature. But if you are thinking this kind of special sampling on a complete random uh, distribution, then it's probably okay. You can still recapitulate what you want to see. But if you have certain bias, then you will start to uh, fall into the problem. And the, the way we try to approach here is we'll try to see on our sample, do we see any kind of special bias or special correlation? Then that will give us a hint how to best use this kind of small sample or tissue microarray. And I probably don't want to go into too much detail today, given the time constraint, but the, just a quick sum up is when I when we look at our sample, the first thing we found is a lot of marker we are looking at, either the tumor marker, immune marker, they actually have this property we call the, the special correlation. So mean, that means if you found a particular marker positive, or, or I should say, if you found a tumor cell, you have a much higher chance to find another tumor cell in your neighbor. And for immune cell, for some immune cell, you also have the same property. And we actually try to calculate all the uh, marker we probe, and we found a various distribution of their special autocorrelation between you and your neighbor. And the, if you are thinking this, uh, and we can start to do some sort of the virtual experiment, try to computationally generate this tissue microarray. Then we can try to see what's the statistical property of this tissue microarray. And surprisingly or not surprisingly, we found this kind of virtual TNA can have a very wide distribution of any marker we test. And they always, they probably always deviate quite a lot from the true mean if we have ability to probe the whole sample. And that's, I think that's the first hint. And that's also not a surprise. We actually come up with a theoretical framework that's based on the special autocorrelation. We can actually predict how much you can recapitulate from this special sampling. So that's kind of first things we try to demonstrate that if possible, in this case, you want to have a bigger sample possible. If your marker or your uh, cell of interest has this kind of special correlation property. So the other thing we try to look at, since we are not just looking at the one slide at the time, we try to look at some other interesting feature from the from previous study that's only look at two dimension. One of them is this kind of tumor body. And this is a kind of important feature, especially in the colon cancer, since this kind of body tumor here is just an illustration that uh, usually you will find a uh, like isolated tumor outside your main tumor mass. And people are thinking this isolated tumor can be the early sign of the metastasis. And they also find a clinical relation between the prognosis and the, the prominence of this tumor body. So in order to understand more on this tumor body, then we try to look at our sample and we indeed see in our sample, we do see a lot of tumor body as uh, some uh, image uh, uh, illustrate right here. But when we try to look at things, we have a serial section from top to bottom across a very variety of the Z. A direction. So we can reconstitute this tumor body region in 3D. And one thing we found actually, although we do see some isolated body cell, but majority of this body cell we see in 2D is actually a continuous structure that's more like a finger-like structure. And when you do the sectioning, you actually, it's just the way you section, you're thinking is the isolate uh, cell, but it's in, in a way, if you have ability to do 3D image, you will see there will be a continuous finger-like structure. So that's one thing we propose, maybe this kind of finger-like structure may be a more uh, a true representation of this metastasis status, early metastasis status, but eventually you may go into a more like complete cell, uh, like isolate cell, but initially you will have this transitional stage 
from a whole solid tumor become a finger-like, become an isolate cell. And the other thing we try to look at is 3D because earlier we tried to see the tumor body actually is a much smaller structure, but we now try to see another structure that also draw a lot of attention recently is tertiary lymphoid structure because people found this in the various tumor, including colon, lung, and other breasts. And now more and more research, either using special approach or single cell approach, and try to kind of clinical uh, correlation with uh, TRS. And they found a various interesting aspect on the uh, control of the uh, tumor growth itself, as well as the response to a various drug. And here is just a summary. The current hypothesis is thinking this kind of PRS structure actually might be serve as a, a hub for mediate this immune cell to distribute to the tumor cell. So if you have a more TRS, you will come up with a better survival uh, in response to various treatment because they can distribute this immune cell locally and the response to tumor antigen more effectively. And we are thinking, uh, also try to look at the sensing, try to look at TRS in our data set and not just look at the one dimension, two dimension, but also three dimension. And the one thing just show you really quick from the figure we, we put in the paper is if you just look at one section, you indeed see various chunks of TLS in the various size. But again, if we reconstitute this in the 3D, we find all the TLS look at like isolate TLS is actually connect into a much bigger network that distribute has certain distribution around various tumor. So, and also we can identify like different uh, domain of this TLS may have different composition. Some of this TLS network will enrich more in T cell and some of them actually is more myeloid cell enriched TLS. We still, this is kind of, I, I believe this is the first view of the 3D uh, TRS with the molecular composition. So it's still a lot to learn, but we, we start to look in the more in the various setting and try to see if this kind of the network composition, either the composition or precision will have any impact on the tumor itself, as well as what's the connection between the treatment response. I would, yeah, I would probably skip this for now. And just a final point about our 3D atlas is we look at the small 3D structure reconstitute and the, a little bit bigger the reconstitute of ERS. Now we are trying to uh, using a different kind of 3D. We are looking at the ultra uh, uh, high resolution and try to look at the molecular interaction between PD-1 and PD-1. That's uh, of course very, of very uh, many people's interest. And then uh, I just show you the traditional view or the view I can find from the paper. Usually they're thinking this kind of PD-1, pd one interaction is happened between the cancer cell and the immune cell. And while cancer cell express pd one and to try to block the PD-1 or try to redirect the program of the PD-1 express cell so they can infect the immune response. Although, I think more and more literature come out and also we try to look at that in our data set. The one thing we found particularly interesting is uh, in this figure, we try to separate all the PDL1 positive cell, either the one that has a nearby PD1 cell or the one that's kind of only have PDL1, but no, don't have PD1 partner. And we found that then we can define the cell that's PD1 cell, PD1 cell that's engaged with PD1 or not engaged with PD1. And when we separate this into two populations, one thing we found very strikingly is the cell that engaged with PD1 is most likely the immune cell or CD45 positive cell, while the one is not engaged with PD1 is the tumor cell. So at least in the sample we've been profiled, the CRC sample, uh, colon sample we profiled, most of the engagement between PD-1 and pd one is coming from the immune interaction, but not necessarily in the immune and the tumor interaction. 
although we don't know what's the meaning here because we, we haven't have a, a solely look of the clinical outcome of this, but at least just a profiling, we see this kind of interesting distribution. And also we found some of the marker that might be associated with the PD-1 cell that's engaged with PDL one for example, like CD44 and HLAA, the NG class one, they do being show are much higher in the PD1, uh, PDL1 interaction cell, but not in the not interaction PDL1 cell. And while we look at this in the 3D, although here is a different kind of 3D, we try to look at a single cell resolution or ultra resolution, and we start to find this kind of interaction. Here, I'll just show you an example. We have a macrophage cell right here, labeled with uh, uh, cyan. So that's a CD68 positive cell. And all the blue cell we label K here is the pan CK positive tumor cell. And then you can see a T. So that's the T cell right here. It's either CDA positive or PD1 positive cell right here. And you can see in this case, we can see a very interesting, like a sandwich structure. While the uh, the main uh, interaction media PD one and P or, or I should say the PD one expression here is mainly restricted to this microphage cell, and they actually engage quite nicely with this T cell. And this the whole thing actually form a, like a triad. We have a T cell interact with macrophage, then the macrophage is next to the tumor cell. Uh, we see quite a lot in our sample, but we still try to figure out what's the implication or what's the function of macrophage here. Will they direct affect the result of the treatment or will they mediate some sort of the immune uh, inhibition of this T cell still under uh, uh, investigation? Okay, so I will try to maybe skip this summary things we want to go, but just sum up with what I say already and if you are interested you can look at our, our paper just published so we actually get a very nice view of 3d uh, colon uh, cancer and we try to find some very interesting or unknown feature that's usually thinking is different or isolate we see a continuous distribution and also we have some interesting finding on the pv1 pd1 interaction in colon Okay, we start, I will shift here to uh, our next story that we want to develop, uh, we call the complementary system of cyclamine morphorescence. And the reason of that is what I will, I will I probably hide it before. I will just point out the main challenge or main limitation of cyclic method, including cyclic or cyclamine morphorescence is uh, because the sample require repeated standing, so at some point you will inevitably damage your sample due to the mechanical force or chemical treatment, right? So here is just to show you a few sample we see in some sample, especially some very fragile sample, we will see this kind of cell loss in a very early on. While maybe some other sample can go further, but we also sometimes see things our chemistry, although it's not super harsh, but still might damage your DNA or other protein. So this is kind of the, the main inhibition to try to push this even further. And also you can imagine the workflow itself, since now we are still doing, usually doing like one cycle per day. So if you want to have a really high dimensional, like for example, 30 cycle experiment, it will run for months. So in a way it's still uh, not so suitable if you are thinking, one thing you want to go clinically. And also because it's uh, it, the damage, the sample will damage eventually. So we cannot get the, the other information from the same sample. For example, the most usual useful information we, we're thinking is this kind of the histology stem or HNE stem. We can get it from the adjacent slide, but we cannot get it from the same slide. And that poses some limitation if you want to do some very interesting integration between the histology and the molecular information. So we are thinking we want to have a complementary system that's pretty much just non-cycling. If we can have a system that's non-cycling, but still high press. And although because it's non-cycling, so 
we probably need to have a uh, some sort of the the, the compensation of, or the sacrifice in terms of the hybrid. So we now go into for size if the the higher we can go is probably hundred different antibodies. But now if we have a a, a uh, another system can do maybe 10 to 20. That already gives you a lot of information on a same sample, especially for this immune micro environment. And also, if possible, we also want this has a compat compatibility of the histology stand. So we can get a same slice stand of HNE or other histology stand with the hyperx image. So if you, you if we fulfill all these criteria, I think the system we have will be clinical ready, right? Because you can think this kind of system will be probably very uh, helpful if we want to augment the traditional approach like IHC or IF they use clinically. And also will be a high suit, much high suit system compared to the cycling process. So we work with a company under uh, NIH fund grant, SBIR grant. And uh, finally, uh, after a few years, we finally uh, make this happen. So this system called Orion system is working with RealSight. And the way it works is using a particular design of optics as well as the panel of the fluor fluorescent spike. And we can go up to 20 threads so 20 different uh, information, or I should say 80 antibody plus the nucleus dye plus uh, autofluorescence information. And on this system, and this is a single stand non-cycling system. So we actually already tried to do the same slide stand and demonstrate in this paper. So here is just to show you an example. We can have the information from the HNE. So you can ask this the annotation that the, Passage you usually can put in when they just look at the HNG. And also, on the other hand, you can have the molecular information. And here, for some case, because the autofluorescence, how to deal with autofluorescence here is a bit different from cyclic neurofluorescence. Since autofluorescence usually has a specific spectrum, the spectrum amazing property of Orion system can isolate autofluorescence out as an individual channel and we can color or uh, show up right here. So in some case, you can see this is actually a collagen layer in the uh, uh, or a blood vessel. So you can use that as an information, not just a, a, a background or problem. Okay, so I will probably not go into too much detail of the principle, but basically this is a hyperspectrum system that can separate the four four that's really close by just like uh, almost like uh, your high dimensional flow cytometry machine, but this is an imager. So we can do multiple four four at all at once, as well as the one thing I just say is we can also discern the auto for instance, using its unique uh, optical property. So try to isolate that out. And now we start to put together a immune panel that as I list right here for a very basic, uh, like CD, the T cell marker, myeloid marker, a little bit tumor marker, but it can give you an overview of the tumor micro environment. And here, just show you a few image to demonstrate with indeed the marker is behave as they should behave. So we start, we actually uh, can do, I think the one thing we, we feel uh, unexpected or surprisingly is we when we have this capacity to try to integrate the histology scan with molecular information, they can benefit from each other. Because here is just show you a complete overlay from the same tissue if we have an HNE and, and uh, some uh, immune marker, CD uh, marker stand, we can start to identify the cell that's either usually presage one thing, because when presage is looking at this, well, in some cases, they can easily use you to identify something like lymphocyte versus epithelial cell. But sometimes there are some cells that's not so easy to <laughs> discern. Then you can use additional marker overlay to help. So we are thinking this might be a potential to augment the power of the pathology. And as well as things, I know that the recent developer of the machine learning, deep learning method, there are a lot of 
histology uh, tool that's using just the HNE scan, they can identify various feature or various uh, cell type or tumor type. And we just apply the sensing here, but we use it differently because you can thinking about in our marker collection, there are still quite a lot of cell that's missed or, or they did not stand anything uh, with our marker collection. And we can try to use the HNE to augment that while there are about 20% of cells we don't see any uh, particular antibody stain. We can actually run through a machine learning algorithm that well developed and they can tell us what, what cell type would that be. Although, yeah, here I just show you most of stroma things. Our marker panel is under 3% of the stroma marker. So they can actually identify this stroma feature just from HNE. As well as some of the, the case, there are some tumor, especially the more de-differentiated tumor. They actually lost their tumor marker. In here, we see a region that don't have the uh, cytokeratin, but from the machine learning or from the machine learning algorithm, they actually identify this region as a tumor. And uh, what we try to ask our pathology fellow to check, they indeed is a more serotic uh, adenal mark in this case. So I think in, uh, now we just demonstrate, yeah, it, although it looks like a, a very simple addition of the, the, the multiple image, they actually can help a lot and contain a lot of information. Let me try to check our time because, sorry about that. I will probably just skip a few, but maybe this one is still uh, something I want to, cover is, so for the one thing we try to use, so now we have an immune profile panel and we have our two already. So we actually try to see if something we can apply immediately. And they are a, a, a method that's been well developed and FDA approved. And I think in also much, I think less popular in US, but more popular in Europe is we call immunoscore, that's using in Poland. And the immunoscore, the principle of immunoscore is very easy. They look at the two stents, CD3 and CDA, but they look at in a specific region, either inside the tumor, we call tumor center, as well as the invasive margin, uh, IN represent here. So it's in tumor border. So they look at the CD3 and CDA stent in these two regions and come out with a score that if you have a high CD3 and CDA in both regions, then you will have score of four, the ETA. And then you have both low, then you will have score of zero. And they found this score actually a very good predictive marker of prognosis. So if you have a high score, usually you, you will have better outcome. If you have a low score, that means you have more immune infiltration, you have better outcome. And we just try to see if we can do that in our uh, sample. And it's for us, it's very straightforward since we have all this marker available. We can actually recapitulate using a semi-automatic approach to identify the tumor center or immune uh, invasive margin automatically using the tumor marker we have here, and also quantify the CD3, CDA in this region. And from our cohort, we actually get recapitulate, pretty much just recapitulate of what the immunoscope uh, result. And we could, if you got high score, you get better prognosis in terms of the progression for your survival time, as well as low score is uh, poor uh, progression. But I think we, we actually come up with this further. Since we are not just at the uh, CD3 and CDA, we try to put all the marker we have in here, these certain different immune marker. And using a similar principle, right? We look at the, for example, like CD20 in a tumor center or in an invasive margin. And uh, we come up with uh, a little bit uh, uh, over 10,000 combination of this kind of the marker. Then we can try to see if any of this combination has better performance than the original immunoscope. And indeed, Although immunoscore actually performed quite well compared to all the other combinations, it's probably the top five, but we still have about 4,000 or 3,000 combinations. That's much better than immuno, original immunoscore. And we just pick one example here to show you 
in the top uh, uh, performer, we call it IFN2. That's uh, the reason we picked that is we completely avoid the CD3 and CDA, but using the other marker, including PD or L1. And in here, we get like twice uh, better performance than the IFN2 using this combination. And we still try to look at all the other combination and try to figure out what's uh, what's the potential use in the here. But I think that's the first things we're thinking by using a complementary profiling of the immune uh, score, we can kind of advance this uh, old clinical practice into a different label. And the last thing, I will try to skip that uh, due to the time constraint, but maybe just a very brief overview of this, because if you are thinking the immune score, the first thing we come out, or the, the, the additional uh, immune score plus we come out, is a approach we call is a top-down approach because you you do need to have some sort of hypothesis driven. You need to look at the uh the tumor center and tumor margin. That's kind of require prior knowledge. But we try to see if we complete if we can use uh, some approach to completely generate a marker that's the normal generate. We call the button up approach to come up with a biomarker that's useful. The way we are trying to use is using a machine learning model called LDA. And they've been used for the language or understand the language. And you might see that very often on the media that you can have this kind of work crowd from a particular literature. They try to see if they have any over represent concept in this paragraph or in this text. And then they can represent in this way and come up with some uh, statistical model. And in a way, we just try to transform this because we just, if you are thinking, we just replace the word with the marker, right? Is the molecular marker. And then the sentence or the paragraph will be a different special region, or even in this case, can be a different sample. Then we can apply the same statistical model and try to see if there are any over represent a uh, topic in this set of sample. And uh, we do find a very interesting topic in here. We we have a one topic that's kind of more or less uh, under uh, expected is the CD20, or we are thinking this is uh, actually represent a TRS structure. And as I mentioned earlier, that uh, TRS actually will be positively correlated with outcome. And that's what we see from our result that this kind of the CD20 topic is actually well correlated with your progression free survival. But we also found a two other topic that the normal generate from this model is also more or less like a tumor uh, intrinsic marker from the 10CK or e -cadherin. But they have slightly different because one of them is more pen CK prominent, one of them is the equally here prominent. And we found, although they are very similar, but one of them actually negatively correlated with the outcome. One of them have no impact with outcome. And the, although we don't understand the reason why we have that, but uh, luckily we have the H and E stand from the old sample, and we can identify the where is the topics, uh, one particular topic high region? And we just try to ask our pathologists, they immediately realize this topic seven or the one with the poor outcome actually is more associated with the, the feature that is a dissociate tumor or de differentiate tumor. So in a way, although they don't have, uh, the model itself did not learn from the morphology, but it come out with a feature that will match the, the previous known morphology that's correlated with the poor prognosis. With that, I think we are summarized here and hopefully I still have like one minute or two minutes to go through the future direction. And I would want to save some time for maybe some questions. Okay, so like I say, the Orion, the one surprising or one pow most powerful thing we found from the Orion system I just mentioned is this kind of integration. And we are thinking this integration can be used either now we just demonstrate we can learn something from the h &E model, but we are thinking we can use the molecular information as a ground truth 
to train a better machine learning model that can help to uh, either assist the diagnosis or assist some sort of biomarker discovery. And also, we actually try to combine both because in Orion, although we say it's a one-shot system, it's clinical ready, but it, it's still limited on the 20 model. So we already demonstrated in our paper that cyclic on the Orion protocol is possible. So now we just combine the decisive with Orion. But if you are thinking incisive, we usually cycle three or four markers per time. But now we can cycle 18 to 20 markers each time. So in five cycles, we can reach 100 frames. Although the, the main limitations here still we need to generate a different panel that's used. But the, the theoretically, this is possible. So you can quickly expand our power to explore this special omic or the, the immune or other microenvironment. And just in a very uh, summary here is, I think there are various approach uh, nowadays that people can use. Incisive is just one of them, and it's probably a, a little bit outdated, <laughs> I would say. So we need a new method right here. But I still thinking there are some uh, future for Sisyph or Orion or Sisyph, uh together. And um, with all the excite about the special transcriptome. The reason I try to say that is uh, if you see the schematic I show right here, although the special transcriptome definitely can give you a very high dimensional view, it sometimes can be a, a whole transcriptome or a whole exome uh, information. But the limit or challenge of that is still on the subgroup. So you either have a very deep view of a very few sample, or if you use the traditional approach like IHC or IF, you can screen a very large sample, but only with a few markers. I think in the special transcriptome uh, peer provider intermediate step that you can have enough tracks that allow you to go over this complex feature, but also we maintain a certain throughput. And I use the Sisyph example. The, the reagent cost of Sisyph is actually pretty, pretty low since we are using the commercial and uh, commercially available antibody as well as no proprietary machine. So that will help us to build our, our inventory. I use this uh, from the AstroPass uh, paper. Is that can help us to build up a, a complete like resource to pro to have a, a, a certain critical number of the sample that allow people to explore this further, but not just limited on the few sample with the deeper view. So I think that's kind of our outlook of using this special, although we do want to do more integration with special transcriptome or other approach that can give us more insight. But in the end, we still try to see if we can increase our capacity to understand more on the individual difference in here. So we start, I just want to thank all the people doing this work. This is a bigger community in our lab. It grows pretty fast. And also, yes, a quick uh, thanks for everyone to join this. Hopefully, we still have one or two questions. I probably will stop my... North. But also some uh, inf uh some website that provides some uh, useful information if you want to learn more about Sisyph or Orion. Thank you so much. Great, thank you so much, Jerry, for that um very varied presentation. Um does anyone have um any questions? Um if so, they can write them Sorry. in the chat. Um so for now maybe I can start off with a question. Um so Coming back to your um, high resolution um, PDL1, PD1 engagement analysis, mm -hmm. um, have you, firstly, have you done this on sort of a large enough cohort where you can look at the correlations between prognostic markers, predictive yes. markers, and the utility of this? Uh, that's possible. Actually, that's another um, study in our lab. Where we look at that in melanoma. And they do have some finding initially to show this kind of interaction. But I think the, the challenge with that is if you want to go higher resolution, then that actually limit your throughput and you kind of bias yourself. 
So we try to see if we can find, like, like we do in the, the previous papers, we have a, a low resolution view to try to screen the interaction by just looking at the neighborhood analysis. But later on, we try to go into the high resolution to confirm the interaction. So, but yeah, it, it's still challenging. And hopefully technology can, uh, they, <laughs> they, they are new technology coming every day. So maybe eventually we will have the power to do high dimensional in large scale and look in this uh, in more detail. Yeah, it'd be really great to get more of these uh, spatial analyses in clinical trials um, where they've got real sort of patient outcome data and things like this and a proper clinical utility. So um, uh, we have one question in the chat from Elias. Um, he says, thanks for the super interesting presentation. Um, your results regarding the spatial statistics comparing TMA cores and whole tissue sections suggests that with non-established markers, one should not use TMAs since we cannot estimate the error from the sampling. Would it then make sense to have a publicly available resource for which markers are still viable yeah. for TMAs <laughs> and for which you yes. should not use whole sections? <laughs> yeah, that's actually where we are prepared a manuscript and have an even more deeper view on this. And I would say, yeah, there, there are also some other research from the other group. They have come up with some sort of statistic framework to how to accommodate this. We 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 won't say it's not impossible, uh, it's not uh possible to use TNA, but just need to be used with precaution that you will have this kind of sample bias. So in a way, TNA still provide you a power to probe multiple patient cohort. It's just you need to see if some of the marker or or in some disease setting, you will have this kind of particular special correlation. And there are some setup we are thinking, we are trying to test experimentally to see if there are also a better way to design this TNA, because usually the TNA is just select by the passages, but maybe there are some sort of design principle, either how to locate this in the tumor based on your uh, other information. That might be helpful. Okay, thank you. Thank um, you. Okay, maybe just one last question um, from Amjad. Um, Thanks for the amazing insights. Considering one-shot IF imaging data, are there some advantages in terms of storage compared to cyclic IF data? Um, that's an interesting question. So, so storage. Uh, you mean the the storage of the tissue or storage of data? <laughs> I know a little bit confused about the question here. So so image data. Okay, the image data actually pretty compatible because it's the same. Uh, our output format for both uh, platform it's completely the same. Either you use cycling method or use one shot method. The only thing we we'll define the how uh, was the size of the data is just the how many channel you have or how big the sample you have, right? So for the one shot method, of course, because they limit by twenty channel, so the size will be have an upper limit right there. For cycling method, for some of our research, like I say, we can do up to sixty or hundred marker. Then the size of the image will be very big. And uh, yeah, that's one thing we are struggling right now, how to process, how to store, how to share this image. But I think that now just as uh, many people in the field also try to work on the same topic. And we thinking there are some very good solution will come in after. Okay, great. Um, are there any more questions? Um, no, I don't think so. Um, okay, so we've come to five o'clock anyway. Thank you so much for um, yes, taking thank the time you to so present, um, Jerry. It's been really fantastic. Um, and if you have any further questions for Jerry, then um, forward them onto the Spock and then we can forward them on to you as well. Um, yeah. But yeah, thanks everyone for attending. Um, and thanks for your time again, Jerry. It's thank been great. you. Yeah, thank you. This is a great <laughs> opportunity. <laughs> thank you, everyone, okay. for joining. Take talk. care. Yeah, take care. Bye.